started five minutes after afternoon. <laughs> How are we doing? Good. Um, thank you all for being here today. This is such a meaningful moment for us. As you know, we had a very big and important kickoff right before Thanksgiving of the initiative that we're going to be really focused on today. And to have everyone back here in this room with our commitment to continued progress reports to <laughs> are we good over there? Nope. No audio? No audio. Ooh. You don't need my voice too hot. <laughs> Mic check. Mic check. One, two. <laughs> that was just the practice run. One, two, three, four, five, mic check. Check mic. Good thing I grew up as the child of musicians, by the way. Okay. All right. Let's pick up where we left off, right? <laughs> Thank you all for being here for another Together We Will update. We good? Okay. I'm just seeing lots of things in my peripheral vision right now. Um, as I said, we had a very significant moment with so many of you kicking this initiative off um, just before Thanksgiving. And our commitment at that time was to continue to bring you progress reports and updates and to hear feedback. This should be a two-way dialogue. This initiative is really for everyone in our community and by everyone in our community. So thank you for being here. I want to thank the Buell Public Media Center for hosting us, thank you all very much, and our partners at Rocky Mountain Public Media, thank you. And just to really kind of dive in, as a reminder, we've all had a holiday, we've all had a little bit of moment since uh, our first kickoff. So as a reminder as to why we are here, we all know that downtown is the heartbeat of our city. And we've seen significant momentum over the last 10 years, three years, even through the pandemic in two years, and we can see a number of those statistics right now. Can we forward that? Thank you. <laughs> uh, these are statistics that you've come to know and love from the Downtown Denver Partnership, but just a couple of examples of what we're seeing in terms of momentum downtown. When we look at the $2 billion of investment in projects that are underway right now, we celebrate our 35,000 residents in the downtown core. 100,000, if you just draw that radius a little bit bigger to our connected neighborhoods, the construction that we're seeing around us right now, we know that there's so much positivity in the downtown market. We also know that that momentum is vulnerable. We know that what we have seen and the outsized impacts of the pandemic on our center cities across the country is true and it's real. And the difference that we see here in Denver is the way that we all come together to strive for solutions to ensure that we have that safe, beautiful, and active downtown. So as a part of this initiative, we all gathered together. And again, the majority of this room was standing with us to stand up and address the challenges before us to ensure the health and safety of everyone in our community, to commit the actions and the resources that are necessary to make a difference and to stand up and acknowledge that the quality of life that we're seeing on our streets every day is not quality of life for anyone. We've also committed to the holding those who are instilling fear and causing harm in our community accountable while we also reach out with compassionate, holistic responses to help those who are in need. So very specifically, as we get into the action, as we talked about so many times in our individual conversations and as a group, this isn't just about rhetoric. This is about the action on the streets. So together, the Downtown Denver Partnership and our action partners, the Denver Police Department, the City and County of Denver, the U.S. Attorney for the State of Colorado, the Attorney General, RTD, a number of these action partners Law enforcement, judicial, and social service partners have come together with these committed resources that have been going since that announcement in November. We're going to talk a lot about that progress in this presentation. 
So a few of examples of those commitments, as you can see, the Downtown Denver Partnership, we're leading the effort. You know, I often say we're in a really interesting position as an organization. We're not policymakers and we're not law enforcement, but we're collaborators, and we're here to bring everyone together to ensure that we continue to keep our foot on the gas. We also launched a campaign to support our Clean and Safe app. So hopefully all of you are using it. We'll talk more, make sure everybody has it, but I will ask for a show of hands. How many people are using our Clean and Safe app? Fantastic. Very good. Ryan's going to talk a little bit more about that. And we've opened our pop-up security center on 16th. So we now have that visible presence of our private security right there in the heart of downtown. From the city and county of Denver, we've seen the opening of the Aid Diversion Center. And Director Saldate is going to talk more about that as we get into our panel discussion. Growing response times and incorporating multidisciplinary teams that are out on the street every day. Implementing a public health hotspot program. That was a commitment made in November that we've seen move forward. Again, we'll talk about results to date when we get into the panel discussion. With RTD, working with the Denver Police Department to increase law enforcement, making Union Station a more welcoming and inviting environment, pr and providing mental health support. So much about what we're doing is that combination of compassion and enforcement that is fit for the individual who is in need, and RTD has fully embraced that. Securing state funding for peace officer recruitment and retention, we're seeing that from the Attorney General from the state of Colorado, and working to develop and improve the infrastructure necessary to abate the opioid crisis, which we all know is one of the most significant factors in what we're seeing on the streets in downtown and throughout our city today. And then finally, from the U.S. Attorney's Office from the District of Colorado, hiring prosecutors to work on violent crime cases, particularly when weapons are involved, to get those guns off our streets and out of the wrong hands. So these are just an example of some of the actions from our action partners. Again, we'll hear more. And then with so many of you on our advocacy partner list, we have rallied the community with more than 40 organizations coming forward from business organizations like the Chamber to our RNOs, to our neighborhood groups, and even individuals. This is truly a public, private, and neighborhood community collaborative effort. Our advocacy partners have pledged their steadfast and vocal support to join together first and foremost. We are in this together. Together we will to advocate for state and local legislation that strengthens the tools that are needed for a safe and vibrant city. With our current legislative session, this is incredibly important. Adopt shared messaging and communicating as a united front, and communicate regularly to ensure feedback is received and we have that two-way communication. That's why we're here today. Our advocacy partners have also committed to promoting efforts to get people back downtown to spend time and spend money. Public safety is not just about crime. It's not one dimensional. We need more of that activity, more of that vibrancy, more of support in downtown to help address so many of the challenges that we see today. We've committed to support the Denver Police Department and our crisis intervention workers by saying, hey, we have your back. We'll volunteer, we'll give time, we'll give resources absolutely critically important as we move forward. And finally, inviting a diversity of perspectives to the table. As I said in November, and I will say again, this is an evolving process. We need each and every one of you to bring five more people to the table. We need that feedback. This is about all of us, not one entity, not one agency. It's about our entire community. So with that, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce our Director of Safety and Security, Ryan Ertman, and he's going to give you a little bit more from a statistical perspective on the progress that we've seen with a couple of the specific initiatives coming from Together We Will. So Ryan, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Courtney. It's uh, an absolute honor to be here, and it's an honor to be part of this program. This, it, this, this is a comprehensive and collaborative effort that has, has been amazing to me and, and my career and what I've seen. Is I've never seen anything like it. Uh, but just to give you guys a, a little bit of a background and where this all started, part of the responsibility of the Downtown Denver Partnership and the Security Action Plan is to look at stats and figure out what is the, like for example here we have the, the traffic, the foot traffic. Where are people spending the most time? 
we also evaluate other, th other statistics along with this. And you can see, I just want to keep this in the back of your mind because we're going to go to a next slide in a second. But look where all the red areas are. You can see where all of the foot traffic is and uh, see that that's concentrated in that downtown Denver area. Of course, as we go, another uh, uh, metric that we're supposed to be paying attention to is we pay attention to our security activity. And that means the security, ac the proactive activity as well as activity that comes to us via the app or some other call. Those calls to service are highlighted right here. And you can see there's a little bit of a concentration here in this downtown Denver area. We can refer to this as the convention corridor. We use this as an opportunity to show that this is an area of vulnerability that we need to address. So the Downtown Denver Partnership does what it does best. It got together with its partners and it said, we need some help. We, gotta, we have to address this and we have a, a public safety concern that we want to be handled. So with that, the, the city came up big and the city said, here's what I got. I've got a bunch of agencies, I've got a bunch of resources, we have people. We have people with subject matter expertise. So the city committed with the Downtown Denver Partnership for the Together We Will initiative and gave us resources. And that is the best thing under these circumstances that we could use. These subject matter experts came down and said, here, we're here, what can you do, what do you need us to do? And these subject matter experts included outreach specialists, Housing, er, housing initiative specialist, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> we have the uh, a public, public, safety public safety expertise, you have uh, graffiti abatement teams, and we've also got mental health clinicians, uh, medical professionals, all these people coming down to help us out. We ask for some assistance from our enforcement partners. We have to hold the, the uh, people accountable, those again, as Courtney said, that are creating fear and, and concern in our city. Uh, all these groups together, they come down and they give us a couple hours and a couple hours of their time. These are the most dedicated and specialized people that I have ever met. And they come down and give me a few hours to say, here, let's reach out. And they, they reach out to the, the community and they meet people where they are, find out what they need, what resources can we bring? And they bring them. And they bring them with low barriers. The idea of this is to meet people where they are, give them what they need, and present as few barriers as we possibly can. That way, if they say, yes, I would like help, we get them that help and we get them, their, get them that help quickly. Some of the stats that we can, that we can demonstrate are pretty amazing. Uh, right here, we have 36,965 square feet of paint. If you haven't noticed that we've removed a lot of graffiti in the area, you're not paying attention. It's been a huge, huge impact. 2,505 square feet of pressure washing, same thing with the graffiti. We have 506 proactive contacts for outreach and education. This is, again, that group of people going down and just meeting people where they are and saying, hey, how are you? What can we do for you? Here's some hand warmers. Here's some water. Here's a snack. What can we do to help your situation? Whatever that situation may be, meeting people where they are. These contacts can take anywhere from a minute to half hour to an hour, even better, if, even longer if we've done our job, excuse me, done our job. 88 referrals to treatment, welfare checks, and resource connections. These are meeting people out there and, and asking them, can we, can we provide you some help? What is it that you need? Well, I don't need help right now, but I sure would like some information. So we give them some information on whatever it is that they need, if it's housing information, addiction information, mental health, we'll give it to them and we provide it to them right there on the spot. The next one is the eight direct connections to support. This is the one that I'm celebrating so much because this, was, this means that we've taken somebody, we've asked them what they needed, they've told us, and we've provided it again with those little barriers and provided it immediately. So it's a huge part of what we're doing. Nine public health notices of violation. I told you we had some public health specialists out, out with us. They're keeping the businesses responsible and accountable to make sure that their areas of responsibility are taken care of and clean. Uh, 182 arrests and summons. Some people, they're not out there for help, they're just out there to create trouble. So we have to be ready for that as well. And we will, and we have, and there's the, re there's the result of that. Now stats, they tell you what we're doing, they tell you that we're active, and uh, they do say a lot. But what they don't tell you, and they don't give you, is they don't give you the feeling that you get, and that our teams have gotten, when somebody that's been needing help gets that help. It's been amazing to see exactly how impactful that can be to the people and also to the team. They get 
this is, this is a dedicated group of passionate individuals that really, really want to help people. The question that I get asked the most is, how is this different from the other initiatives that the city of Denver has partaken in? I haven't been here for very long and I can't compare the two, but I can certainly tell you I've had a, an extensive career of government work and I have never, ever seen this much commitment and these, this many resources, personnel, specialties, subject matter experts coming together for one community in my entire life. It's been absolutely amazing and I'm so grateful. The other thing is, how are you doing? Is this, is this initiative successful? Well, if you ask anybody around the partnership, they'll tell you I'm pretty giddy with all the resources that I've had and the resources that we've been able to, to bring to the community. It's been amazing. We had a great start, a lot of contacts. We had a lot of people that accepted services, a lot of people that accepted those referrals. And then it kind of just, just kind of slowed down a little bit. We have some work to do because as the winter has come along, and as we've been out making contact with people, sometimes repeatedly, day after day, contacting the same people and being told no, it's very frustrating for our team. It's very frustrating to be saying, we've got it. It's right here. All you need to do is ask, and them telling us no. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to work, and we're going to work even harder. We're going to continue to reach out, and we're going to continue to offer those services, and we're going to build trust with this group, and we're going to show them that we are here, and when you're ready, we're going to get you the help you need. So we have a lot of success stories, but I'm not going to go into that. You need to hear, I want you to hear that from the, the, the agencies and what they're doing and the amazing work that they're participating in. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Courtney. So we have a lot to get to in a little bit of time. So I'll ask our panelists to go ahead and come on up. Stealing an extra mic here. Oh, here we go. Perfect. So together we will. And I'm grateful for our panelists today who are willing to share so much great information. We have Commander Kim Bowser, District 6, Denver Police Department. We have Armando Saldate, Executive Director, Department of Safety, City and County of Denver. We have Carrie Tipper, the city attorney for the city and county of Denver, and Deputy Chief Stephen Martingano from RTD. So please help me welcome our panelists up to have this discussion this morning. So the first thing I'm going to do is just a quick lightning round of introductions. I told everybody your name, but maybe a little bit about your role and how you fit into the picture of the Together We Will initiative. Carrie, I'll start with you. Sure, good afternoon everyone, um, and thank you very much for the warm welcome. So as the city attorney, I'd like to start off by explaining what that is. I, I joke, but it's true. My mother thinks I'm the Attorney General of Colorado. Most people think I'm the district attorney. I'm neither of those things. Um, the city attorney's office is essentially the general counsel, litigation counsel, defense counsel, you name it. It is the law firm that represents the city and county of Denver in, in essentially every transaction, every action. So. We have about 240 people in our office, so we're a big uh, body. And what that means and how I think we fit into Together We Will is that we are involved in all of the decision making. And so we are advising clients, we're working collaboratively, and I'll talk a little bit later about, I think, what a unique position that puts us in as a city attorney's office to really collaborate. Um, I'll just also share that I have um, I come at this from a bit of a different perspective. Yes, of course, I'm a lawyer, but I was also in the state legislature recently. And so now I'm contending with some of the bills that I passed, looking at them and thinking, who passed this? And then realizing, oh, you're the sponsor on the bill. So, um, you know, just a very different perspective, implementation, what it means, and how um, good intentions can lead to potentially bad consequences and having the humility to sort of own that and try and workshop through those problems. So thank you for um, inviting me to talk today. So much. Hello, everyone. I'm Armando Saldate, the Director of Public Safety here in Denver. Um, I have a unique position. It's not a position that the, um, that there's a lot going on out there. I've, I've met with an official in New York. We're trying to replicate our model here, and I provide uh, civilian oversight for our sworn departments and a couple of other departments. So I have oversight over the police department, the sheriff's department, the fire department, our 911 Emergency Operations Center, 
um, our Office of Community Violence Solution and our Youth Safety Program. So with all that, it just keeps me up a lot at night, but it also gives me the opportunity to see all that we do from public safety, all the perspectives that we do, and that really has lent well to me in supporting this effort, and together we will. Um, it's given me the opportunity to meet a lot of you and, and talk to you directly around the issues that we're encountering here in downtown. I've been able to work with a network of folks around the country around issues that downtowns across the country are having. Um, it's not unique to us what we're having here and, and, and get some ideas and really then the allocation of resources, how we're deploying resources. And from what we've looked at it and what was great about the presentation and how we've approached this is really public safety through a public health lens. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. I think our successes are rooted in that. We can't just get at this through enforcement. We can't just arrest everyone on the mall. That's not gonna be, that's not the long-term solution to it. And we really are trying to address public safety through social determinants of health and all sorts of responses. So I'm happy to be on the panel today. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Kimberly Bowser. I am the commander of District 6. So um, I guess what I wanted to talk about is why our partnership, why our why it's so important for us to be partners with the downtown action team. So quick story as to why I wanted to be a police officer. Um, ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to be in a position where I was going to help somebody. I wanted to help, I wanted to make an impact. Uh, I thought that I was going to be in the medical profession, but I quickly learned that I'm a fainter. So um, <laughs> my path became clear pretty quick that I wanted to go into law enforcement. And this uh, partnership on the downtown action team is exactly that. It's a chance to collaborate with all of our city partners. It's a chance to collaborate with all of you. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be here. So that's me, thanks. So I asked to go first, so I didn't have to follow Kimberly. But <coughs> my name is Steve Martin Gano, and I am the Deputy Chief of the RTD Transit Police Department. A little bit about myself. Um, I have 30 years of police experience. I worked for the largest police department in the world for NYPD, came out to Colorado. And I worked for what was at the time the smallest police department here at RTD, where I was officer number five. Um, what you'll you'll hear, I'm sure, as we as we speak, the growth, the direction RTD wants to go. Um, we're here for one purpose: is to provide customer service excellence for our passengers on our public transportation model. That's who we are. We're a public transportation company, and we are here, and I am here to make sure someone gets from point A to point B as safe and secure as possible. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. So the, the first question that I want to talk about is something I want to hear from all of you. Um, I think we all are very well versed in why we've all come together in this way in this very concerted effort um, really to look at that holistic approach as we've talked about. You know, it's the compassion, it's the law enforcement, and to make a very quick and tangible impact that is also long lasting. So my question is really in terms of some of the progress that you've seen, what have you seen be most impactful and what's different about what we're doing today versus maybe a year ago? And Chief, I'll start with you because we've made eye contact. Oh, thanks, yeah. <laughs> so Carrie's been on a panel with me before. She knows I'm like, whoever's looking at me gets the question right. first. So um, it has been night and day uh, for RTD in the last year. Um, the partnerships we've had, the city and county of Denver stepping up, the support from our CEO, um, really pushing forward in regards to uh, security and making RTD, what again, what it's intended to be. Um, our Denver Union Station is unrecognizable from a year ago today. Uh, it is wonderful down there. We have gotten so much positive support in regards to everything we've been doing. Um, RTD is also one of the first transportation agencies in the country to do a co-responder model. Uh, we stole it from Denver, but every time people ask me, I tell them that I originated it. Uh, where we put mental health clinicians with our police officers. That has been such an impact. Uh, we know that a lot of individuals utilize RTD, um, and some of them do have, you know, experienced mental health issues, so having that support right there firsthand. We turn that into a federal uh, grant where we now have a homeless outreach coordinator. We have a lot of individuals. I mean, we have 2,300 square miles at RTD services, um, eight counties, 40 cities. So we, we experience a lot of individuals, not only in the downtown area, all over, um, sometimes going on properties and, 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 and using that as a, a uh, shelter, tents and stuff. Um, the safety in regards to you know, railroads and buses and everything else is um, you know, number one for us. So having a homeless outreach coordinator has been um, 
a great, great uh, model to have. But just again, these three people here, the support they have given us has been huge in, re in turning around um, the main, our main hub, uh, Denver Union Station. Commander Bowser, just go back to you on, then I promise we'll jump around a little bit more. Um, so I would say the greatest impact has been a couple of things. Um, first of all, just obviously the coordination and the collaboration with all of the stakeholders involved. Um, we made some incredible um, contacts, communications. Um, we've been there every step of the way. So the uh, obviously, as the director said, we, we cannot arrest our way out of these complex problems. These are significantly complex issues. I don't have the answer to them, but I think there's a lot of smart people in the room that together we can, we can make the impact. Um, as far as our numbers since Monday, um, our participation on the action team has resulted in 193 arrests and citations. Definitely for those chronically um, service resistant folks. Um, but along with that is we've done tons of outreach, tons of connections to services and have several stories that I'll share in a little bit. But um, that's, that's what I would say is our greatest impact. Thank you, you guys keep t taking my answer. But I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, if you look at it from that year ago, what's different from a year ago? We talk about the collaboration as much more. We're now talking, we're meeting, we talk on daily basis around the problems we're encountering, but really around the solutions. Before, when an officer encountered someone on the 16th Street Mall in crisis that's trespassing or being assaultive, you know, the solution was, well, we're gonna arrest them, we're gonna take them to jail, they're gonna get cycled out of jail before any sort of help can be given to them or treatment and they're gonna be cycled out of jail in a matter of hours. And they would likely be back out on the street in that same situation during that officer shift that just arrested them. Um, it's a cycle that kept going on and it was our police officers that came to us and said, we need something else, we need us somewhere else. And, and really, the, yeah, they're trespassing, there's a low level crime here, but really the, the root cause is, a, is either substance misuse, mental health, maybe both are co-occurring. Is there places we could take them for that intervention? Because if we could help that one person, the call volume that that one person can continually generate is literally hundreds of calls. We've seen it. We've seen the folks that have always cycled through that are the high resource utilizers in our criminal justice system. So now we have all these other resources that we're working on, the aid center and other folks that we're, we're getting people connected to hopefully treat that root cause problem so that we're not just cycling them in and out of the, the criminal justice system. Yeah, sort of following along the same theme of the co collaboration, and I've been with the city for 10 months, so I don't have that full perspective, but I've even seen a change in the last, let's say, four months. And, and so as the city attorney, I represent Armando's, all of the safety agencies. I don't represent RTD, but I'm on the phone with RTD's general counsel and with Dr. Fitzgerald, um, we are collaborating closely. And what's been sort of extraordinary is, is following what um, Director Saldate just said is that looking at the mental health piece and the substance misuse, and, and, and frankly, that is, I think, the biggest challenge in the city. And you know, we can say it's people that are resistant um, to care, and until you go on a ride along, you, know, you don't think that, that that's actually true. Um, I've done the ride along, and, you, and you, you see individuals who are just they are sick and they need help, but they do not want it, right? Um, and so what I have been focusing on is partnering with um, really mental health folks, housing folks, um, clinicians on how do we, let's look at the system as a whole. So we're all having the same conversation and what's sort of extraordinary is in this conversation, it's sh sort of shocking to admit, it's the first time all of us have been in the same virtual room talking about one issue and what our responsibility within that wheel is, what's the spoke that we have. And, and the most recent result of that in a conversation we had this week is we're all going back to our agencies and saying, okay, the piece that we are responsible for. So if we have an officer on the homeless outreach team that encounters someone who, and we have this, individuals that are barefoot walking down the middle of Colfax in 15 degree weather, and to the officer's credit, he's sort of falling behind with the sirens on making sure no one hits him, but we all know that person um, though they might not be an imminent threat risk to someone else, that person is, is not well and needs help, but they might not want it, right? So we said, we take that individual and how do we connect them to services? And it's logistically, it's okay, who responds? Who transports? Does the hospital have a bed? 
and we guarantee that they're not going to be right back on the street within three hours. If no, why? What are the obstacles to that? Do we Are we working with our outpatient um, providers, our clinicians, our s- housing folks, identifying what's the kind of stabilization that those individuals need? It might not be an apartment. They might need sober. You know, it's all of these different things. Basically, the life cycle of someone. Um, the director and I were in a meeting this morning um, where this figure uh, was thrown out um, that sort of these f- uh, individuals that we know have multiple uh, interactions with the criminal justice system and the amount of money that that costs taxpayers, right? And then just the indignity of that. That person is not getting the services that they need. It's not benefiting anyone. Um, and and so identifying those failures, and we have not been able to do that because our conversations have been somewhat siloed, right? So that has been, I think, upended, is that we've, and I'll speak candidly, egos have been set aside, um, we have said, okay, we know there are obstacles, but we're going to put those aside and just identify what is what we think is the ideal way to do this if we had all the resources and we didn't have all these constraints. And so we're just starting there, and everyone's coming to the table with some ownership over what they can change and what they can work on. So I've also described this as a wheel where everyone just needs to shift a little, and I think we're seeing that. So th- that has been the transformation that I've seen. And this was picked up, I think, by all of you as a theme. Um, Commander Bowser, I'm going to ask you to really speak to... (laughs) (laughs) Is she getting multiple mics? Um, You know, the involvement of SUN, or Substance Abuse Navigators, and STAR, and bringing that outreach component to the effort. Um, How has working alongside outreach case coordinators worked, and what, what are you seeing in the field? That has been the single most um, force multiplier of any of the tools that we've had. Um, In 2020, I was the assistant to Chief Kazin. I was fortunate to be able to start this program from the ground up. And I I can't tell you how the great impact that it's been seeing the program evolve over the time. So um, I see Mandy is right here in the audience. She was one of the first people I hired back then. But um, each district has an outreach case coordinator. They're phenomenal. They go with us on the DAT team. They are able to make those connections with people. Um, they have a fund now. It's not a lot of money, but there are times where they can put people up in hotels. I have a couple of stories where um, on one of our first DAT team operations, our outreach case coordinator was able to connect two elderly folks to uh, a bus ticket to New York City. They had been stranded in Denver for approximately a week with no means and no resources to get back home where they were going. They were homeless. Uh, Kaylee was able to set them up in the hotel for the night and get them on a bus to New York City shortly thereafter. And so that's just one example of the amazing uh, work that they do every day. And I can't tell you how much of a benefit your community is seeing from their work. I just wanted to add one thing that I, I really want folks to understand is when someone is ready to accept services, it is like a, a flash in the pan. We have an, a very short window to connect that person to resources um, because otherwise they're sort of um, in the wind. And I mean, what you just described, the ability to just be able to activate in that moment, um, the ride along for me was really impressive to, to sort of hear the stories because I, at the end of the day, I said to the officer, like, why do you do this? This is so distressing. Like you lose faith in humanity when you see what people suffer through and what they put each other through. And he told me this story about um, Sarah. And it just so happened at the end of the day, it was like he staged it. He said, oh, that's Sarah. And I thought, oh my God, this is not gonna go well. And he rolled down his, his, you know, we're in a squad car and he rolls down his window. And Sarah turns around and it was like ear to ear, ear smile. She comes running over to him. She's like, Nick, so good to see you. she had come up to him about a week and a half prior and said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I need help. And what he did, sort of bending over backwards to help, um, because he's like, that was the only moment that I had. And he's like, I've known her for three years, and that was the first and only time she's approached me. Um, so just recognizing that we need to have, we're, so the eight people, um, that's the maybe the only opportunity we'll ever have. And so we have to have everything ready for that moment, right? Everything ready. Well, and I'll ask you a question now, Carrie, to sort of build on that. Um, The tools, there's a lot of narrative about enforcement tools, what we can and what we can't do, and I know you've been spending a lot of time 
looking at what's currently on the books that we can utilize as tools for either mental health or law enforcement, depending on the need of the individual. Um, so what have you found in terms of what you can use today? And then there's been a lot of news about things like care courts and some proposed pathways to care legislation here in the state of Colorado. So I'd love for you to talk about existing tools and those that may be coming down the pipeline. Yes, uh, and I should have said, like, I missed the memo. It's, you know, wearing fuchsia when we've got everyone wearing black, but that's okay. That's the story of my life. Um, so a couple of things. I, I came at this thinking um, this was really more law enforcement and, like, we need enforcement in these spaces and, and it's not ideal, but law enforcement maybe that entry into the um, criminal justice system, you know, forces diversion is the only connection people have. And really what's happened is safety has kind of fallen to the background because we've realized, man, you know, we, ha we have mental health, like I said, um, housing, all these other, like you said, the social indicators of sort of um, health and equity and all these things. And so that's been um, the, so I would say, sure, we have all these enforcement tools um, on the law enforcement side, but that's not really what's working um, for all the reasons we've described. What's working are these conversations about how do we ensure that Denver ha Health has one to two beds that we, we guarantee are available for people that are in crisis and we need, and then Denver Health's perspective is like, yeah, but we need to know that we can discharge them somewhere. Right, so then how do we make sure that we have some place to discharge them? And so engaging those partners, Well Power and Lucian Centers. Um, so not to sound like a broken record, but, but those are really the tools, because when we look at the California Care Act and the mayor of New York has gotten a lot of attention, honestly, we have broader tools than they have. Um, and I don't want to say that, that that's not working, it's just for us it has not worked because we have not had this sort of continuum of care that demonstrates success. And so we're really trying to nail that down and work on that. It's, I think it's so powerful to understand where those tools are and that coordination, right? That's what we talk about so much, the coordination. Um, Director Saldate, one of the, the tools, or one of the resources, I should say, that is new to the community is the Aid Diversion Center. Um, so I'd love, it's of great interest to learn more about by many people, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the AIDS Center, which is right across, the, it's at 14th and Alati, right across from our downtown jail. We did a soft launch of it back in November to coincide with this downtown action team and the work we were doing. We, we really wanted to get it stood up, um, and we're going to be doing a formal launch uh, with the ribbon cutting that you'll all be invited to on February 16th. Um, it is a diversion center, that's truly what it is. It's, it's a deflection point from folks out of the criminal justice system into connections with social and community services. Um, we're working with a number of partners and we're bringing a hub of resources there so that when we have that person that's ready to accept the service, that wants the help, that they're connected with everything they need from substance use treatment to housing, we have housing navigation there, to um, support services through mental health, mental health clinicians, all sorts of community providers that are there. Veteran assistance, one of our wins has been getting a, a veteran connected with, a uh, homeless veteran connected with housing. Um, we've served through the soft launch period over 100 people. Um, right now it's still in our pilot phase and it's operating during normal business hours. Not our ideal thing, but I, I try to point people to when we started STAR, we started STAR like that, and it quickly expanded when we showed the value, we showed the need. Um, we are having uh, um, District 6 police officers trained in how we should use it, how we can do that, and it's really taken those folks that we see that, that we're, we're interacting with on the mall and bringing them to this hub of it. And sometimes it's a stepping stone to places like the Solution Center where there can be treatment, and it's just really bringing people together. The other thing that's going great about that is we're also doing community work programs, community works. Uh, we were on a tour there recently and I was just so so thrilled. I just saw a packed house in our conference room of folks getting forklift driver training and things and getting people in the work. And what we know is that looking at it through a public health and public safety lens is that, you know, when you can treat those social determinants of health, their work, their, their, their economic means, people will then not be in the criminal justice system. And we touched on that. We touched on how expensive that is. So an investment in the AIDS Center, and I, you know, we'll, we'll, we are willing to host tours. We're willing to also have, um, have community come in and have events there. I'm really trying to expand on that, and it has been a resource that has 
had some great success here. And one thing I do want to see about substance use, and, and Ryan, you, you touched on the stats. What, what I've known in this career is it's hard to measure prevention. It's hard to, you can't, you can't put up the stat of prevention. But one thing I know for sure is that what we've done with this initiative is saved lives. Um, we have saved lives. I know it from Narcan deployment where folks have OD'd and our, our folks were out there and they administered Narcan so those folks are alive today. And I also know it through these extreme temperatures we've been. A lot of the contacts have resulted getting people into, out of the extreme elements and into shelters. So, 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 so very true. Um, so shifting over to RTD a little bit, Chief Martin Gano, you all have made news on a couple of fronts lately. One is the vision to increase the sworn officer um, rank within RTD itself. So I'd love to hear you talk about that, as well as some proposed policy changes to increase public safety on RTD. So first of all, we need to thank, thank Denver. Um, we were unable to write citations within the Union County of Denver until a little over a year ago. We now are able to do that at the Denver Union Station and we're, we're in conversations to expand that. Um, by getting that ability and really being a part of it and also taking some of the load off of District 6 officers for the quality of life issues has been such a huge positive for our customers and then also, you know, employee ownership, right? Um, you know, I go out there, if I'm not able to do something on my own property, um, it, it's, it's, it's not gonna be able to build, you know, our force and build the credibility. Bringing on Chief uh, Fitzgerald has been a huge um, you know, lift for us, somebody with, with big city experience running large departments, um, and we see that now. We have two, two uh, gentlemen here, um, Commander Mallory and Commander Fowler. They just started last week. We're, we're taking our 2,300 square miles, we're gonna break that up into five sectors, so really five uh, police departments in theory, um, and we are trying to expand our officers to about 40 this year. I don't want to tell the secrets because I know other, other agencies are suffering from trying to hire, but uh, we had two start yesterday. We have another eight starting uh, March 6th, and we have um, people in the works to start uh, to hit our 40 officer goal, which is something that's really unheard of. And I think the reason really why is, is they understand RTD. They understand public transportation. They understand that our goal and mission is to really help our customers and our employees. Um, so, you know, we are able to do that first line and front line. Um, like you had mentioned earlier, another thing we're in the paper recently for is, is we're going to be presenting changes to our customer code of conduct on Wednesday. Um, some of that, you know, there have been uh, changes made and I think we regressed in regards to trying to, to uh, you know, operate accordingly. So that is gonna be presented on Wednesday to our board and hopefully with those changes, we could, you know, just expand and do better uh, for our customers and, and everywhere around there, so. Thank you. Um, so I have, lot more questions, but we want to make sure that we have time to hear from all of you. So we are going to move into um, some audience Q&A here and a little bit of a discussion with our community. So please raise your hand if you have a question and we'll run a hot mic to you. Question? Yeah, it's really bright from where we sit, so take no offense. Yeah. From the house, any questions? Right. Go ahead and stand up if you want to say your name too. Sure, um, I'll stand up. Um, I'm Rob Harris with Denver 7. Um, my question actually is about the crime reports. I just pulled up from Denver Police. And in the Central Business District, year to date, shows alcohol and drug crimes specifically up like 583% year to date. My question is, going off of the discussion, is that because we're monitoring more now versus this time last year, this time before? Or are we seeing an increase in those kinds of crimes? Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, those are reported crimes, and so those are generally those self-initiated actions and that we are taking more enforcement in. So um, those types of crimes are generally uh, increased enforcement. I don't know that we're seeing an increase in use, but it's increased in focus and enforcement. Another question? Great, go ahead and stand up. And say your name. Hey, thanks everybody. Jerry Orton from Lower Downtown Neighbors Association. I uh, really appreciate all that you're doing. Um, this may be a softball question, but uh, what can we, we being the citizens, the residents, the employees, the business owners, the students, the visitors, 
what can we do to add and aid this campaign? Well, I'll, I'll give the answer. That that's the softball. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> I'll start, but I mean, I would really love to hear from our action partners. Um, so if you go to downtowndenver.com forward slash safety, if you've not already, and if you've not been involved in our advocacy efforts thus far, um, please take a look at that website. We are asking anyone and everyone, first and foremost, that we're speaking from the same book, that we're advocating to our legislators, become very active in our upcoming municipal election. That is absolutely critical in how we move forward. Um, and bringing those resources and support to our law enforcement and our social service outreach workers. That's kind of the snapshot at a high level from where we sit as the Downtown Denver Partnership, but I would love specifically to hear from you all on that question as well. I'll go first. Um, so thanks, Jerry. Yes, yeah, softball question. We appreciate it. Um, but no, definitely keep reporting things. When you see crimes, when you see suspicious activity, obviously we need to have those reports that helps us figure out what's happening, where to deploy resources and that sort of thing. Um, participating in things like this, you know, invite us to your neighborhood association meetings, um, come to our community advisory group meetings. You know, we need to collaborate with you. We can't do this alone. And so your collaboration and your partnership are super important for all of us. We all have a common goal. We have a shared goal with everybody in here of community safety. So. Um, make those reports and invite us to your meetings and participate in ours. Thank you, Jerry, for that uh, question. My, yeah, my, my answer is along the same lines. You know, I meet with you all every couple of weeks, but continued engagement and then I think continued outreach on your part to your neighbors. Those neighbors that aren't coming to the meetings, we'd like to hear from them too. And continuing the reporting, that really does help us. It's helped us do our jobs better on you all reporting the activity and, and what's happening in your neighborhood. Another question? Go ahead. Stand on up. Oh, well, I want you in the recording. We don't leave people out here. <laughs> and please say your name. My name's Chris Payne. I'm a real estate developer here in downtown, so we're one of the investors who's trying to bring more and more people downtown. First off, I wanted to thank you all for the wonderful work that you do. I mean, real adversity is every true character. And we're certainly seeking uh, in the face of adversity at this point. I guess the question I would have is um, far too often I read the Chapter 7 reports or statistics that would imply coming downtown is not safe and as a function of that, trying to get people to come downtown is a hard sell. If you were to pick one thing, if you were in an elevator for 15 minutes, 15 seconds or at Thanksgiving dinner, what would be the one thing you would tell your family members, your colleagues, your friends that's changing about Denver that would, keep, that would get them to come downtown? I was like, I, I, you know, I got like 15 of your 15 minutes, so <laughs> I'll round it out. So I actually received, uh, I took a phone call last night around 8 o'clock at night. I had a, uh, uh, a mother who her 14-year-old autistic son needs to take the train from school home. And, you know, they were hearing that, you know, all these issues are going on, not only on RTD, but, the, you know, around the neighborhood and, and at the stops and, and you know, um, all these type of issues. Her main concern was this, this child was, was getting the independence of riding this train, was growing as a, as a, as a person, you know. Um, going back to about the people that, you know, on the, on the slides about taking away the scariness and the fear, we are doing everything we possibly can and we're going to continue that. But sometimes when you just see numbers on there, <coughs> dig a little bit deeper, ask those other questions. You know, RTD is a very, very safe um, public transportation nationally as, and here in Denver. There may be issues here and there, but sometimes those are people that know each other. You know, some of the crime statistics, you know, we're not seeing it from the, from the tourists coming downtown or the, the, the business owner coming downtown or the daily customer. So don't just look at numbers as a, as a measuring point. Try to make sure you, you hold us accountable to what those numbers really mean and try to have us dissect them because you're going to realize that this really is a safe area, a safe city, and a great uh, you know, public transportation area. So I am a member of the community. I live in Denver. I work in Denver, and I have teenagers. And so I wouldn't say anything different to them or as far as going downtown as I would any other uh, place that they would go. You know, it's, it's safer in pairs. Stay where it's lit, stay where the area is activated. 
Um, be mindful of your surroundings. Don't leave things in your car in plain view. Um, it's all the same um, safety, uh, common sense safety tips that I would say if they were going anywhere. Yeah, I, I want to uh, add to the activation part of that. I think people coming downtown is actually a deterrent to crime. Um, when I look at things like when we had the Avs Victory Parade, when we've had the All-Star Game, when we've had big things happening downtown, um, folks don't like that. Folks that are openly using drugs, they don't, you know, when people are out and about, they, you know, that's, that's a deterrent. So people coming down, the more activities we can bring downtown, and then just know that we are committed to make these place, place safer and, and around issues and concerns. No, we're not perfect. There are still issues that happen downtown, but we have an immediate coordinated response. And when we know big things are coming, we're working to get resources there. So, um, and I enjoy coming downtown with my family and my teenager. Um, we love coming down here and I haven't stopped coming down here for any of that. I mean, I could just add, um, I think about this too from the perspective of leading an organization that was remote and then slowly we were coming back into downtown and I had employees that just didn't want to be there, right? Because they were scared, uh, parking's expensive. And um, I had to self-reflect too that in, you know, being at the Capitol and then being at the city and county building or in the web, um, I'd walk across the street to go to a meeting and I'd, you know, get verbally accosted. I didn't, I, I think once I felt physically unsafe, but I kind of just got used to it. Um, and that's a problem, right? Apathy is an issue as well. And so um, we've really, as an employer, I've sat and had really um, purposeful conversation with, with folks. Like, what, what are your concerns? And when we start to break that down, some of it is hyperbolic, right? I'm really worried about this. Well, let's, let's work with Department of Safety. Let's see if we can have um, escorts if you're leaving late at night to make sure that you get an escort to the parking lot um, or the garage that you're parking in um, two blocks away. But to the director's point, um, the more people that are in downtown, the better it feels. And I have I have noticed a big difference just in, I spent a lot of time playing Frogger running between um, the city and county building and the web building, and I'm late to everything, so I'm always running across that intersection. And I notice a difference in, in the perception of safety, and, and we've talked a lot about that, right? Perception's reality. So even if, if it's just that people don't feel safe, like we can't ignore that, that's meaningful. So um, getting people downtown and then also just having like honest conversations with folks about what their what their actual concerns are and trying to meet them where they are on those concerns. Well, parking is expensive. RTD is very reasonable price. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Well, and I would just add, you know, I think that it, my answer to your question, Chris, is we are 8% above pre-pandemic levels of restaurant dining. Half a million people came down for the Stanley Cup parade. 300,000 people came down for Parade of Lights. Activity is here, and that's not to discount or overlook the challenges that we have. We need to acknowledge them so that we can come forward with solutions. However, the activity and the vibrancy and what I see walking downtown every day is still very spectacular, and those special moments are great. Um, Do you have metrics to show how many people are coming downtown now compared to the same time last year? That's the first part of my question. The second one is, have there been any other conventions that have said they're not coming to town because of fears of being downtown? If you could please answer this. Sure, sure. two great questions, and then we will wrap on that because we are running out of time, and we'll be around to answer a few questions afterwards. Um, in terms of what we're seeing, in ter uh, we track daily pedestrian traffic downtown 24-7, so we know very well. Um, from a daily perspective, so the work day, Monday through Friday, we're at about 54% of our average daily use of where we are, where we were pre-pandemic levels. National average is at about 47%. So while we are not where we want to be by any stretch of the imagination, we are no different than any other city and we're actually performing a notch above. Uh, nights and weekends, pre-pandemic levels. So we are certainly recovering in that way. So it's a really interesting time for cities. This is a different panel discussion in terms of what the future of downtown looks like and the importance of growing overall residents, neighborhood feel, and that direction. In terms of conventions, um, I am not aware of any others that have decided not to come to Denver. 
Um, but we can certainly follow up with Visit Denver on that. But in fact, we're seeing um, an increase. So conventions, by and large, what you would hear from Visit Denver if they were sitting here, is that our numbers of conventions are at about 93% of pre-pandemic levels. They're just a bit smaller, which again is a national trend that was happening in the convention center, convention business um, pre-pandemic. Yeah, you bet. Um, so with that, I am gonna close this out. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. An hour went by entirely too, too quickly. But thank you all. Please help me thank all the panelists. <laughs> and just as a reminder, downtowndenver.com forward slash safety is where you will find regular progress reports. You can sign up to get information if you're not already. These, this series will continue throughout the spring, so make sure that you're staying tuned. We want to hear your feedback. And yeah, join us for sessions two and three to hear more. Again, thank you all for your collaboration, your partnership, and for being here today. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>